of the chapter was to show how you can use um, tidy evaluation in, in a GG plot. Um, it, I mean, it works out relatively well. Uh, see if this will open. Is it freezing up again? Repos, random. Um, let me see if this actually pulls it up. Okay. So First off, you know, you start by loading Shiny and ggplot. Um, and so the idea was to actually be able to pop out some of these Shiny apps. And so this is actually popping out one of them. Um, and if you look, it's coming through and it's giving you what your inputs are. Um, and then it's saying, uh, the reactive function is looking at input uh, dollar sign var, which is your select input variable is greater than input uh, dollar sign min, um, which is the minimum. But so if we move this up, notice how it doesn't actually do anything. So you would expect that when you move around the min, Okay, here we go. All right, so you would expect that when you move around the main, it should actually do something, but it doesn't. Uh, simply because uh, the min actually isn't being resolved, it's staying and it's uh, and it's calling it's calling itself min. Um, all right, this isn't working. Uh, okay, so we can see that that didn't actually work the way that we expected it to. Um, so the chapter is talking about indirection. Um, um, uh, Robert, are you showing the output as well? Maybe that screen is not showing up. Let me... Let me show you as the output then. All right, so can you guys see the, the output now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this probably makes more sense. Okay, so if we were actually in this, you would be able to change the minimum, but it wouldn't actually change what the, what the variable was. So the app would run without, without an error, um, but it's basically saying that you're asking for the filter um, and then caret, which is a column, um, is greater than one, but because it's quoted, it has no idea what to do with it. So they say it's it's a problem of indirection, which is um, which is essentially the concept of calling another variable when it's inside a second variable. So input uh, dollar sign var is the variable. Like if you resolve that, that's the variable you want to call, um, but you can't uh, because it's within a second one. So they, they have a reference to two different things as an end variable, um, which are variables you create with, uh, with the arrow, and then a data variable, which is a statistical variable that lives inside the data frame. So like caret is a data variable. I would think of it as like a data frames column. Andrew, did you have a question? Yeah, just, just quickly, if I understand correctly, it looks like the app is not, let me put my hand down. It looks like the app that we make in that first step is not actually reactive, but I feel like it, it is. It's just that like any word greater than a number always evaluates to true. Is that right? Like it comes out like foo or whatever, caret is always, the word caret is always greater than one. Is that right? So, so the way that this actually resolves incorrectly is, I wish I could actually share two screens at once. 
Um, so if we put input Is there an easy way to actually move this around? All right, can you guys see over here? Yeah, so, I've seen your RStudio now. So then if you do input var equals to caret, um, you can get to it by, what is it? So diamonds has carrot, cut, color. So if we do diamonds, so essentially this would be filter diamonds um, input bar greater than one. And we can get this to tidy eval. Is it tidy eval or is it eval tidy? I can't remember. Um, I, I guess maybe I, <clears throat> I guess my question was actually a pretty su superficial one, like just clarifying. I guess I didn't realize that shiny is actually passing in the quoted name, like just the string, the word. Yeah, it always passes, it always passes back a, um, a quoted string. Um, so like like any quoted string is, like if the question any quoted string greater than one, the answer is true. So that's why the data set is always filtered the same way every time. So it reacts, but it just looks the same constantly. And we expect it to look different. Oh, it doesn't run actually. Okay, so in this case, basically what it's doing is, is your input var is is staying as, as a quoted string. If, tell it that it's a symbol, um, if you tell it that it's a symbol from Arlang and you, I can see Russ is trying his hardest to see my screen. Uh, zoom in. Is that better? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. So the so the symbol SYM is is an Rlang specification, um, and then the bang bang is also Rlang, and that will basically the symbol is saying that you're putting a quoted string into into its function. The bang bang is then unquoting the quoted string to to run it. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it gets more baffling than that, um, but yeah. All right, so, so the way that I tend to think about these are resolved and unresolved variables. So if you are unresolved, then you are still packed in your input uh, dollar sign var. If you are resolved, then we're actually getting caret. So basically with dplyr, you, or basically with everything, you can't really use anything if you can't actually get to the to the resolved variable. And generally with dplyr, you're gonna have a resolved variable that's a quoted variable or an unquoted. And depending on which dplyr function it is, depends on which one you actually need. Um, so, uh, you know, it's talking, this next one is talking about your your data variable is caret because that's the variable that's actually in the data frame and your end variable is min because min is one. So this is saying that uh, the caret is greater than the minimum. So that means that all of your caret values are gonna be greater than one. You can just as easily change this min to three and then get all of your carrots greater than three. Um, I actually really never learned base R equivalents for the most part. I don't know if many of you, uh, didn't do the same. I generally 
can never remember uh, whether they show up true or false or how exactly that's going to show up. But um, you can also run this if we run. Going to give you the same thing. Even though, even though it's I I can't remember for the life of me uh, where where the commas go or any of those things. So in this case, we know that the variable is named caret, um, and and in this case, we don't need to resolve it from anything. We can just you know we can type it in ourselves. So the next the next question is is what happens if uh, if we don't know that our variable is named caret? So if we do diamonds var, it's going to tell us uh, we have no idea what on earth this is. However, because it's a quoted variable, if you put it into brackets, it will actually pull it correctly because the brackets will take a quoted variable. Um, and I've actually found that when you when you are directly referencing things like this, to like pull them out of a list or or things like that within a shiny uh, within a shiny app, or even like in a sub list of a shiny app, it's actually a lot easier to leave it as as a quoted as a quoted string and then pull things out in this way, simply because it's consistent. Um, and so then you don't have to worry about like what you change it to that. And I don't, I've never found a dollar sign to actually be willing to, um, a dollar sign to be willing to actually use like a, an unquoted or an unquotured variable. So basically your only option if you're actually passing something in to select a specific variable is to use your base R functionality and to basically pass it into the into the brackets, um, which you know isn't perfect, but but it but it does work. So in this case, they're talking about tidy evaluation. So uh, because because we all know that with a um, with a tidy function, your your first argument is always going to be the whatever's being passed in from the left hand side. Um, and in this case, it's generally dot data. And so you could actually say dot data dollar sign caret. Um, and that will actually, that'll pull through correctly. And then because, because min has basically been stated in general terms, um, you can pull it in from your dot environment, um, which is like the, the current global environment because it's been defined in the current global environment. Does all of that make sense? I'm, I'm going to guess sort of. That's kind of, yeah. I, I'll, okay, I'll be candid. I was confused by this distinction drawn between a data variable and an environment variable because I've, I guess I've always mentally had the mental model that, yes, yeah, some variables are defined in the global environment and then some are, are defined in like the environment of the data frame. Like, you know, if you're, if you're a baser like me, I came up on base R and I like used with a lot, mm -hmm. like with data and then you do some function with the, the variable names, but like our data frames different from environments. No, like, but functions are functions, functions, are. functions are different because once you actually go into a function, um, you actually then go into a second environment and then to actually get back to the original global environment, you generally have to go to a parent environment and then God forbid it's like three functions down, you may have to go back three or four of them or you have to define your environment before you actually can go into the function. So you then can reference the environment. It gets really messy really quickly. Um, that being said, Shiny, if you ever, uh, if you, this was a trick I learned, if you ever uh, need to actually know what the output of, of a variable was in Shiny. Um, so like say you run your app and you actually wanted to get like the data frame that was created before like the visualization, just so you can like go through it and, and see what's in there. If you do that, so, so alligator, alligator dash, that will actually pump it out from, from, the, from the shiny environment, from the app environment to your global environment. So you could, you could run an app 
like your normal like uh, like UI server and have a variable in there that is that's your double alligator with with a dash, and you can then get to whatever that output um, once the app has closed. Does that make sense? It's also a way that you That's can actually cool. push um, push a a variable out of a function. So so the double uh, the, the double I can never remember whether it's less than or greater than it, the double will actually push it outside of a function, so it could then be referenced somewhere else yeah. and not have it be a specific byproduct. Russ, did I just confuse things? No, no, no. That's that, that's correct. It, so, like the, the 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 kind of canonical example of using this would be if you had uh, a function that returned a function. Um, so, within the body of the, the 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 outside function, it returns a function to you, but you set up a kind of caching variable inside it. So it's a way of like every time you evaluate the function that's returned from that, you can update the cache by kind of stepping into the environment of the original kind of parent function that made the thing that's sent back to you. But maybe that's not a very good example. It's very hard to describe code in, um, <laughs> in, uh, in words. But uh, yes, um, yeah, this is the operator that says step up one step above the current environment and modify a variable in there. Um, but yeah, so when you're using that within Shiny, is that like you'd you'd put a browser call within something and then? Yeah, so so you don't even have to put in the browser call. So so say say it's outputting things, but you're wondering if it's actually like uh, retaining the variables or say. So a lot of times when I will actually run into cases where I need to be able to just specify something with a dollar sign in a shiny variable or in a shiny app, what I'll basically do is rename um, or mutate uh, like, a, like a dummy variable name to be that, that variable. So, right, right, right. and so then you can reference it as a dollar sign because you're always updating it to um, to what of their, to whatever the variable was that was passed in. Um, and so, yeah, if you just want to see like what what the value is, or particularly what I found useful is sometimes browser functions. It's really hard to figure out like where exactly you need to stop something. Um, sometimes you stop it too early. Sometimes you stop it too late. And so, especially when debugging. If you if you output it to the global, you can at least see like where the transformations were occurring and see whether or not it had actually transfer transformed things correctly. And especially when you're trying to evaluate some of the variables you're getting in from the input functions, sometimes you really need to basically be able to pull it out to to look to see whether or not um, the variable is actually correctly resolved. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think, so. I think so. Okay, so that data will get you will get you the the data from from your left hand side, and then the environment. So this is this is the shiny app, um, and then you can fiddle with it. This one is um, right here. So like now, now if we change it, um, it actually updates correctly. And in this case, we've got data bracket bracket input var um, is greater than dot um, dot environment input min. Um, and so this is this is pulling in from the from the environment that it's pulling in from. Uh, the way that all of this stuff was written, which made it difficult, is a lot of this was written with Shiny Test, and they actually buried a fair number of other functions um, in other places uh, that needed to be referenced. And so, to try to make this a bit easier to just pull up, uh, we lose some of the some of like the pictures that you actually get in the in the chapter. 
So they wanted to show uh, an example with, with ggplot. Um, so here is, here's one of them. So your, your, you, can change, you can change your x variable and you can change your y variable. But in this case, you know, it's saying your x variable is dot data um, uh, input input uh, dollar sign x input dollar sign y and both of these once again are are coming up as quoted strings. So um, actually, So just for reference, we can get this to run. Oh, I don't specify that. Okay, never mind that. Um, this will work. And so up here, if you can see, look at underscore y is actually showing up as a quoted string for sepal width. And then if we come back in and we change our y to species, and then we close it, it updates it to show us that, that it actually changed the species. And so this is, this is a useful way to kind of check to make sure that a lot of your input functions are actually like outputting the right sort of things as well. Um, uh, but you also have to remember to take all of those out, um, you know, if you send it to production. Um, yeah, they they then put some some plots next to each other. Okay, so now they're talking about how to actually do it in dplyr. Um, once again, it's uh, you know dot data, um, and then the the input var. This is actually basically the only way that that you can reference these things in um, within here. However, the one other way is okay. So we don't really care that much about that. Okay, so let's just look at these first. Input var is mpg. Um, input min is zero. Input sort is mpg again. So one way to get this to work is to run this. Um, and it should. So, and then you can see the table. A lot of times if you actually are in a browser function um, and you tell it to run something that you normally would assume that it would run and show up underneath, a lot of times it will then output it is like extra gray to here. Um, but then it's difficult because you can't really do much with it. So I have a tendency to to just output it to to an environmental variable and then you can look at it. Um, so another way that you could do this would be so rather than the dot data, what you actually can do is Sim, since we know that this is a, uh, since we know that's a quoted string, so funky two, you know, the filter is coming up the same um, with the same number of people in it uh, because that's basically resolving to, uh, to MPG is greater than, um, than two. And because min, is uh, is a number rather than a variable. 
um, R doesn't have trouble resolving to it. So if it's if it's a number, you don't actually have to worry about how to get um, how to get it resolved. Uh, only only if it's like a, a quoted or an unquoted string. Um, and then you could do the same thing down here in a range. And then it's just coming up with the, so, and then it's coming up with the same things. Um, so then it's talking about ways that you can, uh, basically do this as a conditional sort for ascending or descending. Um, and, you know, then it's basically saying you can check the descending box and then it will, it'll descend it based on the variable that's descending. Um, you know, much, much the same. It's basically saying that, that if you are feeding it in a quoted string, like this is probably the best way to actually resolve it out. Um, stop. So if we come farther down, these, so, okay. So user supply data, it's much the same idea simply because we are, we're bringing things in. And so, so the function in this case, so data is the function that is actually bringing in the data. Um, you can uh, you can refer to it uh, with uh, you know, the function and then bracket bracket um, to to actually get at that variable because that particular function is outputting a data frame. Does that make sense? Um, and then you can update your your variables and all that sort of fun stuff. Um, but once again, it's it's all about like how how the how the variable is coming in. So here we've got um, a data frame x is equal to one, y is equal to two, um, and then in our input list. So uh, if you actually think about it, your input and your output are actually both just empty lists at first that you can then just insert objects into. Um, and so to, to mimic what, um, what an input, what, what particular things would be in an input, you can essentially create a list and then just feed the variables in. So once again, you know, you've got dot data, um, X uh, is greater than the min, but so if we didn't do it with, in the brackets, Um, oh, well, I mean, it doesn't actually do anything because there weren't enough variables in there to begin with. Okay, so th that's back onto, onto, onto a different, so once again, you can get to it by, by the double brackets. Um, so we get an error message because filter is attempting to evaluate um, data frame input min. So like this, which which doesn't actually exist uh, because min isn't actually the variable. Um, the variable is, so it's saying no, because min isn't actually the variable. The variable is actually y or X or whichever variable you gave it. Um, and so we're talking about how this is kind of the ambiguity of the data variables and the environment variables. And you can get yourself easily into trouble if you basically, like if you had a column in your data called input, you can get yourself into some serious trouble. So with data that is going into Shiny, you should probably avoid having the columns input, output, and server and UI as it's column names simply because that will get things confused rather quickly. Um, so now we're down into base R. And a lot of this stuff actually seems to be uh, pretty close to base R. So drop equals false, which, um, and 
and you also can't do group buys. So then it gets somewhat into tidy selection, um, which is very useful. Um, once again, I was a bit surprised that we didn't get more into non-standard evaluation at this point. However, they did use some of the things like all of, um, and all of will take quoted strings. Um, and in this case, you could have more than more than one uh, more than one variable. Tidy selection and direction. So in this case, you know, you can choose multiple variables and because the statement is all of um, in tidy select, it will, it, it basically unquotes all the variables to put them into the select statement for you. And so, so you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. However, if we just told it this, so without the all of statement, I didn't actually expect that to work. Select. I guess it still works. So select can still take quoted variables. At one point, select could take quoted variables. At another point, it couldn't. Certain dplyr variables can take quoted variables and others can't. Um, and unfortunately, it takes a lot of um, it takes uh, it takes some trial and error to figure out which ones will accept quoted variables and which ones won't. Um, so across is is a uh, something that I would love to use rather than like summarize at mutate at. Um, however, across doesn't generally work with DB uh, with DB plier. So. Um, across and Teradata don't get along, so I actually can't use it. So I'm still restricted to all of the to all of the at verbs, um, but they work. So so that is useful. So we can come back. Um, so in here, once again, we're doing across all of um, which which works because because all of assumes that it's going to be a quoted string. So the last thing that people like uh, when I first started with this, a lot of people would say to parse eval text equals and then and then the uh, the eval would evaluate the text string um, and then parse would pull out only that and then you would get an unquoted variable. It is extremely easy to get it wrong. Um, that's the one thing that I've really found is, is it's very, very easy to get it wrong. Um, and so using kind of the, the way that tidy resolves things I found is more straightforward um, and works in ways that you expect it to. Uh, so the other thing they didn't really go into were things like um, glue. Uh, the glue package uh, where you can use uh, uh, curly bracket, curly bracket, and a lot of times that will actually resolve a, um, a quoted string to an unquoted string, um, which you know, it confuses things a bit further um, because you then, you know, then you don't need to use some of the Arlang stuff to determine whether it's a closure or, or a symbol or whether it needs to um, whether you need two exclamation points to unquote it, uh, it it makes it really easy, but it um, but it can get a bit unwieldy, uh, particularly if you if you didn't start off with it. So is that sorry? Is that using glue to construct st strings for printing to the screen, or is that for constructing column names in in it for for some data framework? 
I, you, what, what's the egg sample in the? You can do a little bit of both. So, so glue can both glue can both essentially act like paste and mm. paste two strings together, or it can actually unquote quoted strings, um, so that they can be used in like select statements or filter statements. Um, you know, and then some of the other things are are kind of your your tidy select and and those uh, those particular things. Sorry, but I know this is a bit this is a bit messy. Um, trying to pop these up in uh, in shiny apps didn't necessarily work very well. I think the takeaway is shiny is always going to output a uh, either it's going to output uh, a character vector of um, of strings, or it's going to output just one single string. Um, and so as long as you think about just dealing with it as a string, um, you should be fine. Cool. Did I just confuse everybody? I don't think so. I, I just think maybe everyone's just being a bit quiet. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, okay. Does anyone have any questions about that? Then, if um, <laughs> um, so, I was wondering, Rama, do you have? Um... Any other maybe examples of glue? Like you said, it might be easy or it might get tricky at some point. Um, so I was wondering maybe if you can later show some examples or share some links that you think it's, it makes it easy, that would be a good thing to look into. Oh, okay. What does glue do with this? Um, um, all right, so here's one for quasi quotation. How do I chat? Uh oh, I was calling data. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> all right. Yeah, calling calling your data data is a very bad idea because it just ends up. Yes, Ross, completely agree. Um, so so like once you get into quasi quotation glue, let me see glue. Um, I've tended to stay with the R Lang um, simply because uh, because it was the first one, and so I learned which things go to where. Um, uh, but glue seems to be trying to like take over for. Um, I mean, Here's another lazy eval. Glue seems to be trying to take over a lot for paste um, and yeah. paste zero. Uh, and like it, it has some very good functionality. Uh, I just think that I may end up sticking with um, with Arlang for its closures and its unclosures and its end closures. Yeah. I always quite liked um, using I, the. I, I've written R packages for a long time because we had to write them for for, for work for my previous job, um, and unless I used the dot data construct from Arlang, I'd always get loads and loads of complaints on when when running R command check against packages because of um, because you're if you're referring to a column name in a data frame, when it's passed through check, it 
that there's there's the, it, it can't work out that that's um the name of a column rather than a kind of existing variable that should be defined in the oh. global environment and so, so if you use dot data dollar sign that'll get those cmd checks to go away yeah, yeah. that's right um so i uh, yeah so i've used i've used that for quite a while but yeah I, I, and and because of not because of learning that i d didn't necessarily need to learn a lot of the quotient and um the other stuff that's always confused me but um yeah uh it's a uh, it's funny because uh, yeah a lot uh, a lot of these things probably not when it's input dollar vars so i don't think that would cause a problem in when when checking you know if if a shiny app was put into a package that would probably pass fine but there the there are things that um that cause problems in in check for oh, for no good reason really um anyway sorry went off on a tangent i guess um okay um and um So Russ, you would use a uh, import, like import from Arlang dot data in your packages yeah, to avoid these yeah, warnings. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I I guess one could also use the you, if you're pretty going to put a shiny app in there, you'd also have to import from Arlang dot env. I imagine it's also inside mm, Arlang. Yeah. yeah. Um. All my all my shiny apps are our packages because they are um, I do the golem thing. Right. So. Yeah, so I, I can see that being an issue. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's actually the only thing, I, I, similar to you, I've only, that's when we brush with, um, with Arlang. Sounds like, Rob, you're like a very big uh, uh, tidy evaluation, like booster, you use it. Yeah, I mean, I've spent more time with it than I'd like to admit. Um, so, okay, so here's actually one of the times where I can't actually run this code because it's pretty far down into other code. Um, well, well, you find that. Can I just share my favorite tidy, tidy evaluation anecdote from Jenny Bryan? She says that it's a bit like, she has an R Studio conference talk once where she's, she says that it's like veganism or CrossFit. It's not, not for everybody, but those who are into it talk about it all the time and give me the impression that everyone is doing it. And I, have, I think that that's probably true. Like if you look at the, the R blogs, you get the sense that tidy evaluation is the future. I mean, I use it more often than I'd like to admit, um, just because, I, I don't know, I find it to be relatively straightforward. So one of the things that, all right, so one of the functions that I end up having to do is basically transferring data from, from us to an outside vendor. And outside vendors are notorious for liking to rename things, different things, just because, you know, they want them named different things. So one of the nice, like, uh, tidy evaluation things you can actually do is, uh, so you can basically come up with your list of your new column names, your list of your old column names, um, and then essentially force the names of the old column names to be the new column names, and then do a select with three bang bang, so with three exclamation points, and it will actually select the old variables and rename them all in one step. I'm thinking about why would it not, why is it like why did we not rename them without the three bags? Say that again. Um, why would it not? I mean, I'm trying to imagine why is it not possible to rename them like without the bags? I, uh, I, I I'm seeing this as like um, two vectors that you are defining. Um, or maybe you know it's it's going into a function where you say okay these are the new vectors and this is the old vector and hence you need to uh, unquote them is that 
how you're using it? So within the select statement, basically it is importing it as, as a named vector. And because, you know, uh, a select statement, if you, um, so like if you were to do, um, So you could do, you could just rename it in the select statement rather than having to do a rename and then you can select everything out of it. So the question was, is it possible to basically select all the variables you need and rename them in one step rather than having to do it individually? And I don't know. I. I find it to be incredibly useful because then you can basically get your, you know, because everyone, everyone loves their sort of. Um, I confuse things in the chat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you still there, Robert? Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys see my screen? I can only see your uh, studio uh, at the moment. Okay, so this basically will will pull it up. So so essentially, you've got your old names are X, Y, and Z. You need to rename them A, B, and C. Um, basically, old names becomes a named character vector, um, and so you know X equals one, Y equals one, Z equals one, and then if you run all of this together you then get the output of A, B, and C. Mm. So it's it's one of those things that, yeah, I mean, it it's not useful all the time, but when it is useful, it's very useful. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So. Cool. Right, uh, sorry, uh, everyone, we've, we've kind of hit up on an hour of, um, the meeting, so we probably ought to be wrapping up. Um, is there anything particular you 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 want to mention in addition, Robert? Oh. No, I, sorry that it wasn't more organized and I'll put it in the <laughs> GitHub <laughs> repo. Uh, it mostly runs most of the time. Uh, yeah. I was actually wrestling with it, uh, trying to get it to run without the other programs from from the book uh, and that sometimes didn't work so right cool well thanks for doing the the, the talk though it's uh it's uh, um it's it, it certainly it seems like something that would be quite useful within shiny apps where there seems there's certainly a lot of the, the the kind of toy apps that i've seen so far in the master and shiny book that there does seem to be quite a lot of um kind of you know the filtering and selecting type um uh syntax so maybe the you know if it's a neat way to kind of deduplicate that kind of code um using these uh tidy select um 
syntax. Uh, sorry if I don't sound <laughs> authoritative, but it's really not, <laughs> really not something I've ever um, successfully managed. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, cool. Yeah, no, thanks for doing the talk. So uh, yeah, um, uh, if anyone's got, uh, were, there, were there exercises? I think there were a couple of exercises in this chapter. Um, if anyone's got anything further they'd like to discuss on the tidy evaluation chapter, feel free to use the Slack channel and things and we'll um, try and help you out if we can. Um, so uh, like if, if you, oh, I turned off my screen share. That didn't make any sense. So like this is actually out of actually yeah. a shiny app that, that I run. Um, so essentially, this is outputting a, a character vector, you're unquoting it to then filter based on specific variables. Your group by is then unquoting uh, the, the variable that's coming out of the input. Um, it's selecting again, you're actually creating a, a new outcome variable with a mutate statement, and then you're dividing it by various things. There, I find that with, with R-Lang and with non-standard evaluation, a lot of times you're not gonna get it the first two or three times. Um, and so you just kind of have to switch up which particular thing is being run at any given time. Um, and eventually it will work. That's, that's the best I can say about that. Uh -huh. Good. Right. Well, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's the end of part two of the uh, 